Donc, euh, euh, professeur Yann Christie, on, on est extrêmement honoré de, de vous avoir à l'Université Laval aujourd'hui pour le colloque sur la collection François Lemay. Euh, vous êtes un, un expert de la cinématographie anglaise des premiers temps, euh, plus particulièrement sur euh, Paul, qui est un des premiers cinématographistes importants de l'histoire du cinéma. Et euh, on voulait avoir vos lumières, en fait, sur un objet extrêmement intéressant. C'est peut-être le, le plus beau proje projecteur qu'on a dans la collection. Le, certainement le plus mystérieux, c'est une espèce de chimère. En fait, on voit qu'il euh, est marqué R.W. Paul sur le, sur le côté de, de l'appareil. En même temps, ce n'est pas un appareil de Paul euh, très caractéristique. En fait, on se demande euh, si ce n'est pas... Euh, autre chose, etc. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous parler de, de cet appareil qui, euh, ma foi, est intriguant? C'est uh, fascinant de voir une machine comme ça. Et quand vous m'avez dit de ça, j'étais vraiment really excité de voir ça. Et je suis encore plus excité maintenant parce que je pense que c'est quelque chose qui nous présente avec une question réelle, une question réelle de recherche. Et ça nous prend nous right dans la période de la période of making and selling projectors. Before uh, the, the, the century, the, the beginning of the century. Exactly. So this is a, a really interesting um, uh, machine for me because it takes us right back into the very beginnings of uh, making and selling projectors. Yeah. Um, Robert Paul was the only manufacturer who was willing to sell projectors at the beginning of 1896. In the world. In the world. Yeah. There's a famous story of how uh, Georges Méliès yeah, was at course. the famous uh, Lumière premiere in December 1895, and he went to the Lumières and said, uh, I want to buy. Mm. And they said, we're not selling. Yeah. So what did he do? He went to London mm. uh, because he had already spent some time in London, and he knew that Robert Paul was making projectors for sale. Yeah. So he bought a collection of projectors, took them back, and reverse engineered one into yeah. his first camera. Parce qu'il avait vu que la, le cinématographe lumière était réversé, donc il s'est dit, je peux prendre un, un projecteur, le transformer en caméra. Exact. So, um, we know that Paul was, uh, he was very much in demand at the beginning mm. of 1896. People were, you know, queuing in his, outside his office, trying to buy a projector mm. to take to different parts of the world. So he made um, a whole series of different projectors And in fact, he, he wrote about this. We have a, his own record of it mm -hmm. in a catalog page, which he sent to a German pioneer who was trying to write his memoirs. O Oscar Mester. Oscar Mester. Uh, he sent this to Mester in 1932. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting about it is that Paul has handwritten on it mm -hmm. um, his comments on the different projectors. So we have his own retrospective history of the evolution of his yeah. projectors. And we have some other sources as well. Just to explain, we know that he made um, a very early projector, which he called a theatrograph, mm -hmm. which was um, bolted to the stage of the Alhambra Music Hall in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know about this because a magician, Carl Hertz, who was passing through London, wanted to buy one, and Paul wouldn't sell. Mm -hmm. yeah. But eventually, Hertz brought a screwdriver and took it from the stage <laughs> and took it around the world. Yeah. In fact, he traveled uh, all around the world with his projector. Paul had to work to make a new projector, to mm. replace it. Yeah. And that was actually the beginning of the evolution of his projectors, uh, okay. right from that moment. Est-ce que, avant de faire des projecteurs, avant d'être en, ciné en cinéma, c'était quoi son, son background? C'était le kinetoscope, la lanterne magique? Est-ce que vous pouvez l'expliquer? Uh... Yes, Paul um, was, was not... Um, working at cinema. He was an electrical engineer, an electrical mm. instrument maker, when he was approached by uh, some entrepreneurs who had come from America to make uh, kinetoscopes, yeah. uh, cheaper than Edison's yeah. kinetoscopes, which were very expensive. Yeah. So Paul manufactured probably as many kinetoscopes as Edison ever did. Mm. So he had experience working on kinetoscopes. And then he had developed a camera with Bert Akers during 1895 when Edison refused to supply them with films. Mm. So he had two stages before he produced his first projector, yeah. which he produced probably in December, January of 1895-96 mm. because he knew that the Lumières had launched their cinematograph. Yeah, uh, à partir de mars, en fait, tout le monde le savait. Exactly. Yeah. 
And he had already been in communication with Lumiere about it, mm. um, unsuccessfully. So on the same day, February 1896, the Lumiere cinematograph was demonstrated in London yeah. in the afternoon, and Paul's machine was demonstrated in the evening. Est-ce que le, le, vitas, le Vitascope euh, Edison était euh, après ou avant non, non. Euh, Après. Ah, non, après oui. Donc, on a le projecteur, le cinématographe, le, le projecteur de, de Paul. Euh, Edison, avec son Vitascope, euh, arrive à quel moment à Londres Est-ce que c'est dans les, 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 les mêmes semaines, les mêmes, les mêmes mois The Vitascope, uh, Edison's Vitascope, was developed um, as a rush job. Mm. Uh, under pressure, obviously, he, he acquired someone else's patent and marketed it as yeah. the, his Edison Vitascope uh, in, in time for April um, mm. 1896 when he did his premiere uh, mm. uh, in, in New York. So it comes third in line, really. Yeah. And it's, it's a hybrid yeah. that Edison has essentially taken over and rebranded. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so, and they're not on sale generally until a little bit later, say yeah. in the summer. So really, still in the spring and early summer of 1896, uh, Paul is really the only supplier. Yeah. The other manufacturers start to arrive during that year of 1896, which becomes the great year of you know, the availability of, of film equipment that you can buy on the open yeah. market. The Lumiers are still refusing to sell. Yeah, yeah. So to become a Lumiere um, operator, you have to d acquire a country franchise. Mm. On sait que, que Méliès est revenu avec, euh, je crois, deux projecteurs euh, Paul. Euh, il en a transformé un éventuellement en, en caméra. Il y avait aussi des, des films euh, du kinétoscope Edison. Euh, Est-ce que c'était des copies que Paul faisait ou, copie, ou Paul pouvait acheter des, des, des copies Edison à l'époque? Paul a um, tried to establish a working relationship with Edison. Yeah. And uh, it's quite interesting because he, he wrote to Edison saying, well, um, why don't we cooperate? Mm. Edison refused, yeah, but he kept the sample films that Paul had sent. Mm. And this is how Edison had the film uh, Rough Sea at Dover, mm. which was the big hit of his Broadway show in April. Uh, at quelle époque? À quelle... This is April 1896. Okay. I mean, it was a film that Paul and Akers had shot in already a year mm. earlier. Okay. Sometime like March uh, 1895, mm. they had shot this film of the sea breaking uh, yeah. over a pier at Dover. And it's the one film in the Edison show in 1896 that everyone wrote about. He said, yeah. you can feel the water coming yeah, yeah. into the auditorium. Oui, parce que les films uh, Kinetoscope et Edison, c'était sur fond noir dans la Black Maria. Il n'y avait pas ce, ce côté oui. extrêmement vivant qu'on va retrouver avec le cinématographe Lumière qui va faire le succès du cinématographe uh, très, très vite. En fait. oui. The, the, the kinetograph camera was a, a gigantic machine mm. which was absolutely anchored in the, the studio in, in West Orange, and so you couldn't take it anywhere. You yeah. had to bring the subjects to it. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. a very different kind of film. Yeah. Le, le fond noir, justement, à, à cause de la, la question de la lumière, qui, yeah. qui est très important dans le kinetoscope, qui, qui, yeah. qui empêchait d'avoir de, de, yeah. ces projections euh, euh, en extérieur. Et... Yes. Now, the kinetoscope uh, period is, 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 is extremely interesting. And in fact, for an exhibition which I've created in London, I've actually built a kind of replica of the kinetoscope um, and put in it some original kinetoscope films so that people can have the experience of looking yeah. into the kinetoscope. Because I think for us, it's hard to believe that this is what really started the moving picture revolution. It was mm. seeing the cues of people, the lines of people who formed mm. to look into a kinetoscope. Yeah. And it's... it's Historically, I think very interesting for us to go back to that moment and ask ourselves, really? Was that how it began? Yeah. Because that's what inspired everyone else, including the Lumières. Yeah, of course. Uh, th their father saw this happening in Paris, and he went back to Lyon and said to his sons, we could do better. Yeah. Um, Est-ce que, justement, en fait, l'expérience du kinétoscope, pour euh, j'ai déjà regardé à l'intérieur d'un kinétoscope, on a l'impression, en fait, à cause de, du mouvement euh, pratiquement du kinétoscope, en fait, on voit la, la, le, le, fil qui, qui, le, le film qui déroule en continu avec la, mm. la fenêtre qui arrive très, très vite. On a un peu le sentiment d'un jouet d'optique, en fait. Euh, et, et on a l'impression que c'est comme une étape... Euh, un chaînon manquant entre, entre les jouets d'optique et éventuellement le cinématographe et le, le projecteur de Paul. 
Euh, et donc, il y, y a quand même une différence de, de dispositif, de, de réception. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez en parler un peu plus ou euh, la, la transition d'une certaine façon entre les… Euh... It, it's interesting because the kinetoscope, it depends on our philosophical framework. Yeah. Are we thinking about an evolutionary process? Yeah. The definition of cinema. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for a long time, the kinetoscope has been kind of ignored. We all know it existed. We know it was important. Um, it's an object. We know the photographs. Yeah. We know the engravings, not even photographs. Yeah. But actually, the kinetoscope was more, um, perhaps more diverse than we realize. Mm -hmm. Because yes, it was one machine. And yes, the only source of films for it initially yeah. was Edison, West yeah. Orange. Yeah. In, um, the, the single camera, yeah. the secret camera. Mm. But actually, of course, people started making films in 1895 for the kinetoscope. Yeah. And Paul and Aker's work, um, they had to create their own camera. And there was nothing that said that they had to make films that ran at the same speed. Mm. So the hypothesis has now been developed that maybe some of the non-Edison films made for the kinetoscope actually ran at different speeds. Yeah. Because you could vary the, the speed. The, the, the speed of Edison was... 40, 40 or 45 yeah. Yeah. frames per second. Very fast to avoid flicker. Yeah. But that meant an enormous amount of celluloid mm. running through the machine. I mean, really colossal. It didn't have to be that fast. And of course, the eventual <coughs> projection speed that was arrived at was between 14 and 16. That yeah. proved to be entirely adequate. So really, some kinetoscope films were not made to run at 40, yeah. I think is, is the current, uh, the latest thinking about that. Oui, mais la vitesse de l'obturateur fait en sorte qu'il faut que le, le film se déroule très rapidement quand même. Sinon, on n'a pas l'impression d'une stabilité. The kinetoscope depended on a rotating um, wheel, a plate, yeah. which interrupted. So it was a continuously rotating. It yeah. wasn't an intermittent mechanism. Mm. So you could vary the speed of it. Yeah. In principle, you could shoot a kinetoscope film at, at different speeds and have the... Yeah, yeah. the um, Quasi shutter working mm. at different speeds. Yeah. It was more flexible than perhaps we have realized, okay. which explains why some of the kinetoscope films looked absolutely fine when you projected them much slower. Yeah. Others didn't, but some did. Yeah. Uh, ensuite, donc, le, le cinématographe arrive à la fin de. pendant toute l'année la, 1895. Uh, Paul au début de 1996. Um, quelle est la différence entre le projecteur de Paul et le cinématographe lumière? Est-ce que c'est amélioré, c'est plus primitif, c'est à peu près la même chose? No real connection at all. Okay. Um, the, I mean, Paul didn't have access to uh, a Lumière cinématographe, okay. uh, as far as we know, and, and nor does he. He wouldn't have tried to copy it because he knew it was completely patented, mm. and he understood patents very well. Yeah. Um, so that would have been not, not a question. Mm. The Edison system of pulling down the film mm. uh, was not the direction that he really went in. Yeah. Um, he thought about this as a, an, uh, an engineer. Mm. And he understood after making the camera that it was necessary to have an intermittent mechanism. Mm. So what does an engineer think intermittent? He goes to the history of clockmaking and he thinks about um, mm -hmm. what's sometimes called a a Geneva movement, yeah. or a Maltese cross, mm. a croix de Malte, yeah. or more technically, a star wheel. A star wheel is something that can have any number of points on it, mm. and it functions as, as a way of advancing the mechanism like that. Yeah. It creates the intermittent movement of the film yeah. in front of the gate. So Paul starts off with a star wheel with a lot of points, yeah. too many. So the, as he says himself, when he looks back at the history of his evolution, it's starting with a lot of a, a complex star wheel and gradually reducing this to the point where there are only three points. Yeah. Because three is enough. Mm. And three is good in technical terms because it means steadiness and a lack of uh, inertia. Yeah, yeah. C'est vraiment très intéressant parce qu'en fait, donc, on, on est avec Edison, le kinétoscope, et là, on n'a pas d'intermittence, donc c'est très compliqué de, de projeter des films. Ouais. On est obligé de les regarder parce que la quantité de lumière n'est pas assez euh, importante. 
Et donc, pour passer à la projection, on doit inventer l'intermittence. Et lumière, ils sont obligés, en fait, de prendre un, un, un modèle avant le, le cinéma. Les frères Lumière vont prendre la machine à coudre, c'est très connu. Oui, oui, oui. Et Paul va prendre les mécanismes d'horlogerie, de, de montre, j'imagine. Oui, oui. Et donc, en fait, c'est le... Il arrive à la, au même endroit par des chemins différents, en oui. fait. Oui. En effet, c'est vrai. I mean, it, it moves from being, it moves through different mechanical, mm. historical mechanical solutions to yeah. the problem. It's, it's essentially an engineering problem, yeah. uh, but there are different ways of solving it. Mm. Les, les Frères Lumière ont toujours dit que leur, leur invention, c'était l'intermittence, en fait. Oui. Donc, euh, oui. c'est ce qui manquait pour, pour projeter. Pour donc arrêter l'image yeah. et donc avoir énormément de lumière right. pour être capable de projeter sur un écran. But what I would say is the difference between Paul and the other pioneers, and it's, I think it's an important difference, is that Paul was a trained engineer. <coughs> so he was somebody who was used to uh, making very complex mechanisms, mm. galvanometers, the early electrical instruments, uh, making them himself. He had yeah. trained as an instrument maker and he was running an instrument making business, a very successful one. Yeah. So neither the Lumières nor Edison were engineers in that sense. Yeah. Uh, they, they came from different backgrounds. Yeah. They, they, the Lumières from photography, obviously, uh, Edison from telegraphy. Yeah. And so they had staffs of people who were working for them solving the problems. Oui, Carpentier pour, Carpentier. Euh, pour Lumière et euh, Dixon, Dixon pour, euh, exactly. pour, pour Edison. Yeah. But Dixon, of course, his background was in photography. But yeah. That takes us in many different directions. But Paul, I think, was the only person who was looking at this uh, from a, an engineering point of view. And when, when we look at, when we read his history, his own reflections on the history, mm. it's an engineer talking yeah. about how could I improve this mechanism. Yeah, of course. And, and also, Importantly, not just improve it theoretically, but improve it in a practical way so that it can be manufactured. Mm. Because by this time, Paul has had the experience of making a lot of kinetoscopes mm. for sale. Yeah. And he's about to start making a lot of projectors. So it has to be something which can be replicated and can be um, manufactured cheaply enough yeah. to sell. Oui, c'est la, la différence entre, entre lui et les Frères Lumière et Edison. C'est-à-dire les Frères Lumière et Edison avaient inventé une, une, un, un principe. Oui. Et donc, ils voulaient euh, non pas de, avoir des franchises, mais euh, l'exploiter eux-mêmes, en fait. Exactement. Alors que Paul, qui n'avait pas le, le brevet, s'est dit « moi, je vais, je vais en vendre à tout le monde ». Ouais. Et, et c'est comme ça que, que, que Méliès a commencé, que, que beaucoup de gens ont commencé. Je... Exactement. C'est ouais. l'évolution vers le premier stage de ce qu'on appelle le cinéma. Yeah, exactly. Where um, and in the case of in the, in the case of Paul, Paul, I think, did not set out to become a filmmaker. He had no ambitions to be a filmmaker yeah. at all. But it was a part of the logic of the business as it was developing that if you wanted to sell projectors, yeah, you could. You need films. You need films. Yeah. And of it, course, he discovered that selling films could also be a profitable business. Yeah. If you made films that people really wanted to buy, and you were one of the first suppliers. Uh, you could you could make a profitable uh, business in selling films and selling projectors. Yeah. Et, et ça c'est étonnant parce que à la fois euh, Edison a, a, a pas vraiment a pas fait de films. Euh, les frères Lumière en ont fait quelques uns, mais euh, ce qui est différent avec Paul, c'est que c'est à la fois le, un constructeur d'appareils yeah. et un, un, un extraordinaire cinématographiste. C'est yeah. un des, 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 des cinéastes entre guillemets les plus importants du, 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 du début du cinéma. Yeah. Est-ce que vous pouvez parler justement de, de cette... Euh, en, en, en français, on, on dirait qu'il a l'esprit de géométrie et l'esprit de finesse, l'esprit artistique et l'esprit d'ingénieur. Et donc, euh, ça prend une personnalité quand même assez, euh, assez intéressante pour avoir ces deux, euh, ces deux, euh, arcs à, ces deux euh, cordes à, à son arc. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous parler de, de, de sa personnalité, en fait, qui, qui réussit à, à, re, à, à avoir ces deux pôles? I think he approached um, every stage of his activity um, with what I would call the, the, um, the attitude of an engineer. How can I make this good and how can I make it better? And so he's, he's learning on the job. And when you look at, of course, we don't have all his films at all, so we have to guess. But you can see that in, in, uh, in the spring and the summer 
of 1896, he's trying out so many different things. He's, mm. he's really trying almost every kind of film. If you look at the, the catalogue of what he's showing by August 1896, we have one programme of what he's showing at the mm. Alhambra Music Hall, and it's extraordinary because there's something of everything. He's mm. doing little dramas, he's doing films of the street, of traffic in the street, he's um, filming a scene from a play. Yeah. There is no genre of what we would call films that he hasn't really attempted towards the end of that year. But then I think something really interesting happens because in 1897, two important things. He tries to float a company uh, about film, mm. Paul's animatograph yeah. company, and it's a failure as a flotation. Uh, not enough people are willing to buy shares because not enough people think that the business has a future. We're reminded it's of the old Lumière. Yeah, Lumière. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I think the important thing about Paul is that he, he, he realizes that the, the business community is not really ready to take this on board, even though the figures that he produces are fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it would be one of the most profitable things you could invest in. Yeah. But still, people are not convinced. They think it might just disappear. That's one thing. The other thing that happens is they have a huge success with the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. Mm. Uh, Queen Victoria has a jubilee. Film companies from all over the world come in 1897, in July 1897. Mm. And, and they all film it. And these films go out across the world. Everybody makes money. Yeah. This is how it's seen everywhere. It's the first great film event. But what Paul said later was that business began to go down after that. Mm. So it is like as we say in English, a flash in the pan. Yeah. Or maybe it was the last moment when people were willing to buy films of just people going past, um, including, by the way, the, the Prime Minister of Canada, yeah. Wilfrid Laurier, who was one of, the <laughs> one of the figures who was filmed as part of the procession. Ah, I didn't know that. And uh, interesting. The, I found a record in the, in the uh, uh, Quebec press okay. of people, when they saw Laurier on the screen, they cheered. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, people were recognizing, yeah. you know, personalities mm. in the films. But what business began to go down. And Paul obviously had a big think about the future of the business. Mm. And it's at this point, in the, sometime in the spring or summer of 1898, that he decides to build a studio. Mm. So he, he buys a field on the outskirts of London and he creates a studio, a real studio. And I think... He did this very much in partnership with his wife, Ellen. Et ça, en 1908? Yeah. Ouais. Donc, c'est un peu le début de la consolidation du cinéma. La location commence à s'installer de, de façon, les, yeah. les salles permanentes un peu partout mm, dans le monde. Non, non, non. Pas en no. Angleterre? Non, 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 non. OK. Way before that. OK. Non, non, il n'y a pas de salles permanentes. Il n'y a pas de fixes cinémas à ce point. Les films sont encore being shown dans une variété de locations. Ils sont being shown dans okay. music halls. Very strong. That's their, their first real. Même en 1908, il n'y avait pas de, de salle permanente. Euh, yeah. Oh hein? no, 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 no. Parce qu'au Québec, on voit à partir de 1906-8, les, les salles permanentes euh, commencent à, en France, pâté aussi avec l'Omnia à Paris, etc. Donc c'est à peu près dans ces dans ces eaux-là. I no? don't think so. No. No, I think you'll find that. I mean, the, the earliest cinemas, as such, started about 1907. Uh, uh, une des choses qu'on dit souvent sur le, le cinématographe Lumière, c'est que euh, un des principes du cinématographe qui, qui est resté très très longtemps dans l'histoire du cinéma, c'est la, la griffe de la, la caméra, parce que ça, ça, ça permettait d'avoir des images très stables, yeah. mais qui c'était plutôt dangereux pour la projection, puis ça pouvait euh, casser le film. Est-ce que les premières caméras, euh, Paul, il y a un principe de ces caméras qui est resté très, très longtemps dans l'histoire du cinéma qui, qui, qui a été euh, repris ensuite par, par tout le monde? Well, Paul um, was interested in, make, in, in constantly improving the mechanism mm. of his, his, the two kinds of equipment, the, the camera and the, the, projector. the projector. In a way, we know much more about his projectors. Although he's selling cameras, he doesn't talk about them in detail. Okay. So they're using essentially the same principle as the projectors. Uh, and the, 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 the two fundamental issues for Paul, as he looks back at the history of technical evolution, are the intermittent mechanism, mm. 
making that as efficient as possible, reducing the number of points on the star wheel mm -hmm. to the minimum. And the other is the, the shutter. Yeah. And the, the, the shutter, the obscurateur, is, um, is, is very important at this stage mm -hmm. because um, it's especially important for projection because it blocks the light. Yeah. So the bigger the um, uh, area of the shutter, the less light is getting through. Yeah. And at this point, remember, the illumination, illumination is a big issue in early mm. film yeah. projection because it, uh, electric light is not yet strong enough or uh, universally available. So electric mm. light is not used. In general, yeah. it's oxyhydrogen uh, gas, which of course is very combustible, or the, the, the Bazar de la Charité, the incendie. The Bazar de la Charité, célèbre, exactly, yeah. the, the famous case. Or it's um, a limelight, yeah. which is also used in the music halls. Qui est le système de cinématographie lumière, en fait, yeah. qui est beaucoup plus sécuritaire yeah. euh, à l'époque. Exactly, because essentially what all projectors consist of at this stage is a magic lantern behind a film transport mechanism. Yes, yeah, stroboscopic uh, movement yeah. plus magic lantern. Exactly. Uh, no. And in fact, something which I think has not been considered enough is that for at least 10 years, maybe 15 years, a majority of projectors had the capacity to show a magic lantern slide mm -hmm. and film yeah. built in, because you yeah. did both. Yeah. Um, on, peut, on peut dire d'une certaine façon que le, le, les projecteurs, le, le cinéma à, à l'origine, c'est right. une sorte de lanterne magique améliorée. En fait. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, with a film transport yeah. mechanism. Now, for Paul, as I said, the, 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 the basic issues are the intermittent mechanism mm. and the shutter. And what he works at doing is making the shutter smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. And so he's very proud of this. And if you look at his catalogues from the beginning of the century, you see that he actually shows a diagram. Mm. This is my shutter. It's really small. This is everyone else's shutter. Yeah. It's really big. Mm. Une des choses qui, qui est très importante dans les débuts du cinéma, c'est que comme on a très peu d'images par seconde, on a 16 images par seconde, l'effet le, stroboscopique est très, très grand. On a ce oui. qu'on appelle des flickers, on, oui. on voit l'effet le, le cinéma est en, essentiellement euh, euh, le mouvement stroboscopique, exactly. mais, mais quand c'est très, très lent, on yep. voit vraiment le noir, le blanc, le noir, yep. etc. Et c'est très fatigant pour les premiers spectateurs. On a énormément de, yep. de comptes rendus qui, qui parlent de ça. Et donc, est-ce que euh, Paul a, a, a compris ce problème et est-ce qu'il a essayé de le régler assez rapidement? Ab ou... Absolutely. No, no, he, he, he sees that right from the start. Mm. And again, I think this is his um, uh, engineering attitude, is how can we make this better? Yeah. How can we make it work mm. better? So he reduces the size of the shutter, and that means that there is, there is less flicker because there's less of the... Um, uh, less of each revolution of the, the shutter, which okay. rotates essentially, is uh, obscuring the light. Okay. So he claims that he has reduced flicker to an absolute minimum. Yeah, ils ont tous dit ça en fait. Uh, everyone said that, you're <laughs> yeah. absolutely right, yes, exactly. <laughs> flicker was the big issue. Est-ce est qu'il est arrivé avec uh, Tree Pal and, uh, ou les, un, un shutter qui serait un peu différent, qui aurait trois pales ou deux pales, ou il, il s'est toujours the, tenu à un, There are different, different patterns of shutter, but... Okay. Um, uh, people are trying to solve this by having a kind of complex multi-part shutter. Yeah. But essentially, for Paul and for most of the other successful uh, uh, manufacturers, it's just a question of how small a shutter can you have yeah. that is enough to cover one frame being replaced by the next frame. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's a very kind of, it's, a, it's, a, it's an engineering question. Mm. And the reason why this, this projector is, is really interesting, I think, yeah. uh, and, and to me quite quite puzzling, is because it, first of all, it's described as um, a 1905 projector. Now, I would say that the projector... Oui. C'est le, le premier cat catalogage. En, no, no, absolutely, en... absolutely. <laughs> but uh, anybody looking at this who is uh, engaged in this particular very narrow period would say, mm. that's a very big shutter for 1905. Yeah, yeah. Anybody who was selling a projector with a shutter that big would not be in business. Right. Ce qui, ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'on voit à la, à la fois, il est écrit euh, « bioscope » d'un yeah. côté et euh, « Paul » de l'autre côté. Donc, yeah. euh, déjà, c'est une chimère, en fait. Absolument. Enfin, c'est un mélange très, euh, très yeah. particulier. Yeah. Et donc, c'est quoi votre 
première hypothèse par rapport à, à ce projecteur euh, mystérieux, en fait? Well, Paul was uh, very insistent that uh, all his projectors had his name, R. W. Paul London, yeah. cast into the stand. Yeah. And he si, said... Quelqu'un ici. Yeah, exactly, as we have here. And he says in his correspondence with Oscar Mester, uh, from much later, he says that, you know, all my machines had this cast in. If they didn't have it, they weren't genuine. Mm. He then goes on to say, uh, but I know that there were at least two people making copies of my machines. Now, the implication is that they would have been copying them and using his name. Okay. And, and uh, so, combien de, de projecteurs qui pourraient être une copie, avez-vous uh, vu dans votre vie? Est-ce que c'est très fréquent de, de tomber sur des, des copies? Uh, no, 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 absolutely not. Yeah. I've, I've never seen um, an authentic Paul copy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not the kind of thing you would look for. But what I would say about this is that, it, I would say, first of all, it can't be a Paul machine, uh, despite the name on it, for two reasons. Mm. One, one is that the mechanism, the intermittent mechanism, is what's called a, a beater. Yeah. A, a beater is a device that was invented in France by Demini. Yeah. So uh, it's not a Maltese... Uh, it's, not a, it's not a star wheel. No. Okay, okay, okay. So it's not a star wheel. That's the first thing. And the second thing is the shutter is much too big. So I would say that it, it kind of corresponds to a style of projector that Paul was selling in 1897. Mm. Uh, and and there's, a, he, there's an image of it. Uh, it looks very similar to that. I mm. think the frame is, is quite yeah. like his 1897 yeah. projector, which he says was very popular because it was light, it was portable, uh, yeah. and he sold a lot of them. Yeah. But this isn't one of them. <laughs> yeah. I think it's modeled on it. Is, is it uh, Est-ce que c'est possible que quelqu'un aurait pris le, le frame de yeah. Paul et l'ait transformé et donc ça serait à la fois Paul et autre chose? Ou c'est carrément une copie I don't know. dans le style? I, I, don't, we, we, I don't know of an example of Paul's 97 projector hmm. in a museum. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure they exist, but I, I've never seen one. Okay. So I, you need to put the two together and compare yeah. them to see. It's possible. Yeah. But why is it... Bioscope. Well, Bioscope was the name that Charles Urban, who yeah. was one of the other great uh, entrepreneurs of this period, mm. an American who came to London and initially was working for um, uh, Edison in London, and then he becomes more and more independent, and then he sets up the Charles Urban Trading Company yeah. and becomes one of the most successful dynamic figures in, in British uh, film. Yeah. Beaucoup de liens avec Méliès. Uh, Absolutely, and he sets up a French company eventually yeah. uh, as well. And he's, he's, he really has an international vision. And of course he has to have a projector. Mm. So he launches the bioscope. Mm. And in many ways the mechanism of this and the name suggest it's, uh, it's an urban bioscope. Yeah. But it, it, it says Robert Paul. Yeah, but it can be a fake urban and Paul uh, projector. Yep, two hypotheses. Mm -hmm. One is that it's a, it's a, a Paul frame mm -hmm. with uh, an urban mechanism inserted into it. And the other is the reverse of that, that it's an urban mm. frame which has been faked to make it look like a Paul. Yeah. Why? Maybe because Paul had a reputation for producing good equipment. So why would somebody make right. a fake only if they thought it was going to help sell it? Ça nous, ça nous donne un, un entrée en fait dans ce qui est très important dans le début du cinéma, c'est yeah. que le droit d'auteur yeah. n'est pas comme aujourd'hui. Même s'il y avait des brevets, yeah. il y avait des guerres de brevets, etc., euh, tout le monde copiait tout le monde, tout, tout le monde euh, reprenait les, yeah. les principes de, 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 de leurs voisins. Euh, on, peut aussi, euh, on peut aussi voir qu'il y a probablement plus d'interactions entre les pionniers, c'est-à-dire de, de collaboration entre les pionniers, que ce qu'ils ont bien voulu en dire dans leur mémoire, où, où ils sont plutôt en guerre contre l'autre compagnie, etc. Ouais. Euh, et, et on voit qu'au début, euh, on, il y a quand même des, des passerelles. Le, le Lumière travaille avec Gaumont. Euh, euh, et, et, et donc... Euh, probablement qu'il peut avoir une collaboration qui, qui on a perdu la trace, en fait. Est-ce que ça serait possible ou, ou c'est juste euh, on a volé le droit d'auteur de, de notre compagnie? Je pense que vous êtes absolument correct qu'il y a eu beaucoup de copier et de stealer. Mais je pense qu'en quelque sorte, bien sûr, c'est un monde dans lequel les gens comprenaient les patents très bien. Ils vivaient 
by patents. Yeah. And they employed lots of lawyers, and they were very quick to um, uh, make legal threats right. if they thought their patent had been infringed. And I, I think the, the, the world of early cinema, let's say from 1895 until 1900, right. roughly, is a world where there are well-established brands in existence. Uh, there's Lumiere, well, they're becoming less and less important. Mm -hmm. There is uh, Edison, who is a fantastic publicist, the promoter. Plus en plus important. Yeah. And there is Paul, who has established himself. In his later catalogues, Paul actually says, first in 1895, mm. still the best in 1902, 1903. So he is, he's got a sense of his own um, um, <coughs> status, his own standing in, in this world. And I think it would have been, it was important for him to defend the identity yeah. and the um, uh, authenticity of his equipment. Yeah. That's why he's so insistent on it. But it, equally, that could have made it worth other people's while to imitate him. Yeah. En fait, c'est intéressant parce que je n'avais pas compris cette distinction-là. C'est-à-dire que le droit d'auteur pour les films était plutôt flou et les gens se copiaient très facilement. It, mais pour les, les appareils, au contraire, les brevets étaient beaucoup plus yeah. euh, efficaces et, et les gens... Euh, Et donc, on, on voit la guerre des brevets s'est faite essentiellement sur, sur les appareils, sur le qui a inventé qui, euh, etc. Well, there, there's a kind of phantom in all of this, which is the, the, the Freeze Green patent right. of uh, 1890. Yeah. Uh, Freeze Green had deposited a patent, William Freeze Green, in Britain, which, of course, he never executed, he, but he deposited a patent <coughs> for a device that would show rapidly changing pictures. Mm. There's a very strong feeling in the part of some researchers who've looked at this that uh, Edison was worried that he had infringed, potentially infringed um, Edison's patent. Mm. Uh, sorry, that. Uh, Freeze Green. Uh, Freeze Green's patent. Right. And the suggestion is, this is just a hypothesis, but it's a good one, that maybe the reason why Edison did not um, patent the kinetoscope in Britain mm. is because he thought he would come into conflict with Free Screen's yeah. patent. Yeah, of course. Later, uh, we know that Edison kept very close watch on Free Screen and patent. And later, in 1902, he would start to insist that he held the master patent. Mm. And then he started to use that to try and drive everybody else out of the business, of course. Yeah, of course. Totally fraudulent. Yeah. But he had the, the, the money, the power, the reputation. Mm. So he, was, he made great progress with it. Now, what I would say is that um, the question of, of droit d'auteur in the, the French style of copywriting films is, is quite different. Yeah, yeah, Nobody course. knew how to yeah. copyright a film. Yeah. Edison didn't. He just sent rolls of paper film to the Library of Congress. Yeah. The American system was completely different from the European mm -hmm. system. Paul actually was the first person to copyright a film. He used the copyright system in Britain insofar as it existed, and um, he lodged uh, uh, a copyright notice on mm. um, one of his films about uh, rough sea breaking in Portugal mm. this time. Mm. <laughs> sea Cave near, yeah. near Lisbon is actually the first film that, mm. that is um, copyrighted in Britain. Il faut comprendre que la mer, les vagues qui arrivent sur... À l'époque, la plupart des gens ne voyageaient pas pour aller voir la mer. C'est quelque chose qui vraiment s'est développé au 20e siècle. Et donc, de voir la mer en film, pour les gens, c'était un événement extraordinaire. Ils voyaient des fausses mers au théâtre, faites avec du tissu, etc. Et donc, c'était vraiment, au début du cinéma, un succès monstre d'avoir ces images de la mer. Il y a une anecdote dans Georges Sadou, a great French uh, film historian, yeah. he, he tells the story of how um, his mother had never seen the sea, mm. but she had seen it on the screen. Yeah. And when she went to the seaside to see the real sea for the first time, she said, oh, it's almost as good as in the film. <laughs> so, and Sadur was obviously very, very um, fond yeah. of that anecdote right. because it, it showed that it was, you know, that in many ways cinema brought new experiences to people yeah. who, their world was very small. Yeah, of course. Uh, la, beaucoup de gens au 19e siècle ne sont jamais sortis de leur village, en fait. Absolutely. Euh, de juste d'aller du village à la grande ville, c'était euh, yeah. quelque chose de, de très important. Et, et le cinéma, par son réalisme, a amené le monde euh, right. dans, dans, dans toutes les villes, dans tous les villages. Et c'était vraiment... Euh, Absolutely. Il y avait déjà la lanterne magique, mais 
le mouvement rajoutait une expérience très, très, très forte. Euh, on vient de parler de, de Georges Sadoul. Je vais juste rebondir peut-être sur Georges Sadoul. Euh, Georges Sadoul est, est arrivé dans l'historiographie euh, du cinéma. C'est toujours l'idée que l'école de Brighton, les, les, les cinéastes anglais, ont amené à peu près tout le, le cinéma tel qu'on le connaît aujourd'hui. Euh, J'aimerais bien avoir votre sentiment, euh, bon, euh, on, avec toute l'historiographie récente depuis les années, euh, les années 80. Euh, C'est quoi votre point de vue maintenant sur cette, euh, cette école de Brighton, dont Paul est un des représentants les plus éminents, en fait? Well, it's, uh, th th let me separate that into two, two, two answers. One is, what actually happened historically was that um, Paul um, did his first out-of-London show in the summer of 1896. Mm. And so for the what became the, the Brighton group of filmmakers, mm. they saw film for the first time yeah. when Paul came to Brighton yeah. and put on a show that ran at a hall in Brighton for several months. Yeah. So he had a directly inspiring effect on them. C'est comme l'anecdote la, sur les Velvet on the Ground. Très peu de gens ont vu les, les, les spectacles, mais tout le monde a parti en groupe par la suite. Absolutely. <laughs> and so you could say that the, 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 the great burst of I mean, very creative filmmaking that came from George Albert Smith, yeah. uh, James Williamson, especially yeah. Esme Collins. Plus les lanternistes que les ingénieurs. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was galvanized, I would say, mm. by the example of what Paul had already achieved. Yeah. And of course, they could buy equipment from him, and mm. eventually they would make their own equipment, etc., etc., and, and do yeah. some very important things technically. Mm. But the second question about Georges Sadou is really interesting, and I think it's very important for us, the British. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to understand this because Sadoul was the first great historian of cinema who read the catalogues and looked at the films. Mm. And he did his work, his important work in the 1940s. Right. And then he published the first volume of his great six volume, uh, Histoire Générale du Cinéma, yeah. um, just after the war. Now, in volume two <laughs> uh, of The, the beginning of cinematograph. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. But volume one, of course, is important because uh, that was the one that Andre Bazin cinema. famously wrote about, yeah. and that produced his Le Mythe de Cinéma Total, mm, oui, oui. which we could talk about on another occasion. But See, volume the, two... The, the first one is The Invention of yeah, uh, the Cinematograph. Invention. After the that, second one the is The Pioneers. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the second volume of Sadhu, which has never been translated into English, mm. It says very clearly that the man who really invented cinema was Robert Paul. Yeah. Except, very strangely, for some reason, Sadoul calls him William Paul. Mm. I don't know why, but if you look in the index, all you find are many, many references to William Paul. Mm. Paul never called himself that. He was always Robert or mm. R.W. Sadoul a fait beaucoup de, de, just, de petites erreurs. De... Well, it's just strange. Yeah, Where did he yeah. get this idea from? Anyway. Mm. Um, But he's very clear. He says that Paul really established the, the narrative grammar of film. Mm. And especially in this great burst of filmmaking in the, uh, towards the end of 1898, when he built the studio, mm. he started making two-shot, two-scene films. And then he made a four-scene film. And these are the first multi-scene films in the world. Mm. And he said they were much copied. Mm. And he talks about uh, Fernand Zecca. Yeah. as being like the, the élève de Paul, yeah, the, yeah. The, the pupil of Paul, yeah. because everything that Paul did, Zecca imitated. Mm. And so for, for Sadou, there's a very clear relationship between Paul as somebody that other filmmakers copied. Yeah. He says something very interesting about Méliès. He says that, that they were kind of in competition when mm -hmm. they started doing trick films. Yeah. And sometimes Méliès was ahead of Paul, but he, th he thinks... I think he's wrong, actually. Mm. He thinks that um, Méliès' later films are copies of Paul. Mm. I don't know why. Uh, we, we know that uh, Sadou was a great defender, supporter of Méliès, obviously. Yeah. But he's very, he's very objective and very dispassionate. There's absolutely no trace of yeah. a kind of you know, nationalistic... Mm. He says, well, it's obvious. <coughs> If you read the catalogues, Paul did all of these things first. C'est vraiment très intéressant comme point de vue parce qu'on a l'habitude depuis le congrès de Brighton en, en, yeah. en 78, 78, 79, 78. Yeah. Euh, on a, on a l'habitude de casser du, du sucre sur le dos de, de Sadoul en disant voici toutes les erreurs qu'il a fait, etc. 
Mais, mais effectivement, euh, le fait que c'était le premier à aller de, vers les sources, euh, non seulement les sources écrites, les bouquins qui avaient été écrits avant lui, mais également les catalogues. Les catalogues. Et bon, bien sûr, il n'a pas vu autant de films qu'on a pu en voir par la suite parce ouais. que les, les archives ont commencé à nous, 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 nous permettre de voir le, le, énormément de films. Il a, et, mais, mais quand même, cette, ce, 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 cette idée d'aller vers les corporatifs, vers les, 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 les journaux corporatifs de l'époque, de vers les, les catalogues. Euh, C'est peut-être une des raisons pour lesquelles son, son histoire a quand même été le, 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 le premier jalon important dans, oui. dans, dans, dans les oui, C'est vrai. Parce que, uh, at the same time as, as Sadhu was, was writing his early volumes, uh, our first historian of cinema in Britain, Rachel Lowe, was mm -hmm. also preparing the beginning of her great series yeah. of books. Yeah. And Rachel Lowe, They knew, they knew each other, Sadhu and, and Rachel Lowe. They must have shared the same sources. Mm. There is correspondence between them. Yeah, sure. But Rachel Lowe drew completely different conclusions mm. from Sadhu. She said, Robert Paul, uh, he had poor taste. Mm. He made films about uh, you know, trouble between man and wife. Yeah. And, and she was extremely moral and disapproving, yeah. which is really quite amusing because you know she was the daughter of a famous cartoonist and yeah, yeah. so forth and it's it's very strange that she should have been so morally disapproving never having seen the films mm. but she had read the catalog like Sadhu yeah. but she's not interested she's not aware of narrative really yeah. and she has a much less analytical view I think than than uh, Sadhu who was really a man of cinema mm. after all and so Sadhu really brings the first kind of cinematic intelligence to bear on reading these early catalogues because no one could see the films in those yeah. days. Plus, plus économique aussi, plus une, une vision euh, ouais. avec une certaine distance. Euh, vous êtes euh, le grand spécialiste de, de Paul. C'est quoi la vision que vous avez justement sur son importance dans, dans l'histoire du cinéma, à la fois comme constructeur et à la fois comme cinéaste, euh, après, euh, après sa doule, après tout ce qui... Well, I have written a, a big book about Paul, and I've also produced a, a graphic novel, a bon dessiné, mm. of which this is the cover. And the title that we have here is Robert Paul and the Invention of Cinema. Mm. So what I'm trying to do is, in a way, to, to shock the British, especially, mm. into understanding that, uh, surprisingly, mm. what we would call cinema is uh, really something which took shape in Britain at the end of 1898. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we think of cinema as a grammar of narrative, of putting shots together to tell stories mm -hmm. in different spaces yeah, yeah. with the progression of time, that definitely begins with Paul mm -hmm. in autumn 1898. Mm -hmm. So when uh, Thierry Frémaux launches his great exposition in, in, in Paris, uh, Les Lumières, Le Cinéma Commence, Mm. I'm sorry, Thierry. Yeah. It wasn't cinema. Yeah, yeah. It was moving pictures. Yeah. Of course, it was hugely important. Mm. But it was not directly important, I think, to the development of what we call cinema. Yeah. Because actually the Lumiers had no interest in cinema, as we know. Really? It was not their game. So um, I think there's a kind of misunderstanding. Mm. Um, Edison was common, the common source of inspiration to everyone. But Edison wasn't really interested in cinema as we would call it. Mm. Paul is a strange animal because he's yeah. an engineer an who artist. becomes a filmmaker yeah. and a very interesting filmmaker. Mm. And he also establishes the shape of the industry. Uh, if you look at the way his studio and his manufacturing develops just around the turn of the century, you mm. can see all the contours of the industry that we know today. Right. And he drew the right conclusion. Mm. In 1909, he saw that the industry was changing Uh, decisively. There were new people coming into the industry. Mm. Uh, the Italians were becoming really important. The, the Danish film industry, surprisingly, was mm. becoming the most successful. Yeah, yeah. The American industry, of course, behind Edison was hugely successful. So Paul decided to get out of the business. Yeah. He just left the business uh, without any announcement in 1909. And in many ways, you have to you know, recognize that he made the right decision. Yeah. Because it was either a game that you yeah. invested in massively, mm. or you might as well get out. 
C'est intéressant parce qu'en fait, euh, euh, c'est peut-être Akmelia celui qui a compris le plus vite que le cinéma allait devenir extrêmement yeah. important. Yeah. Et euh, comme Méliès, il, il, il est sorti quand l'industrie le, le, cinématographique est, est, a vraiment explosé vers, vers 1908-1909. Donc les deux, finalement, qui ont cru pour les, les premiers au cinéma, c'est ceux qui ont pris le, le chemin des coulisses et qui, sont, <rire> qui, ont, qui, ont, qui ont disparu de, de plus ou moins de bon gré. Yeah. Euh, Méliès, je pense qu'il a beaucoup souffert de, de yeah, ça. Absolument. Uh, he, he tried to keep going with the same model yeah, that yeah. he had. Interestingly, when you look at the, the evolution of the industry, the most successful European, uh, obviously, in, in many ways, was, was Charles Pate. Mm. Uh, it's between Pate and Gaumont, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. So they were both very, the, very the, interesting. The first empire. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, Pate, <laughs> in a way, had started in the business because of Paul. Mm. He had bought kinetoscopes from Paul. Yeah, of course. And he bought his first equipment from Paul. Mm. And then he became, very rapidly through his business acumen, he became um, the nemesis of Paul. Because it was actually in 1903 that, that uh, Pathé started to cut the price of his films. Mm. And he reduced and reduced and reduced the price of the films. Mm. And this threw the entire European industry into panic. Mm. Because they could see that Pathé was going to put them out of business. Yeah, yeah of course. And there's a famous cartoon from this period which shows the British industry, all the uh, producers standing around the table saying, what are we going to do? And they're looking at Paul mm. to see if he has an answer. Mm. And actually, there is no answer because yeah. Pathé is, is going to put them out of business yeah, of by price cutting. Yes, it's, it's, He's got a big enough empire to... Oligarchy, en fait. Exactly. Yeah. So there are important and interesting lessons to be learned I think from looking at that, these relationships, as mm. you implied earlier. Yeah. You said that you wanted to shock the British public in comparison to the history of their cinema, etc. It's interesting because the cliché, if we want, is the famous phrase of François Truffaut. The oh, oui. cinema in English doesn't exist. And at the same time, you show that at the same time, one of the first brevets is Freeze Green, and in the same time, you show that at the same time, one of the first brevets is Freeze Green, and in the same time, you show that at the same time, one of the first brevets is Freeze Green. Euh, yeah. Même Edison, euh, yeah. bien sûr, euh, euh, Lumière par la suite, euh, il y a une, une certaine... Euh, il préexistait d'une certaine façon. Euh, Paul est très important avec les autres cinéastes de l'école de Brighton pour le début du langage cinématographique tel qu'on tel qu connaît aujourd'hui. Euh, et donc, euh, qu'est-ce qui s'est qu passé par la suite? Pour que même les Anglais n'ont pas l'impression que... Le cinéma est sorti de, de... I've been talking about this a, a lot during this year uh, to try to, to um, uh, awaken a sense of national interest. Yeah. It, it, the problem is it, it doesn't have to be nationalistic. Mm. Um, in many ways, I think the French model of saying the cinema began with us is a bad model yeah. uh, because it's, it, it tends to rub out <coughs> history mm. in favor of triumphalism. Yeah. I mean, it's also not true, but it's, it's, it's triumphalist. So what I'm trying to say to the British is, you know, you should take pride in the fact yeah. that somebody actually did bring together the elements of cinema. Mm. You should just be aware of it. Because I think, for me, what's interesting about this is that the conditions that existed in the 1890s, at the beginnings of cinema, are very similar to the conditions that we're living through today with, mm. with uh, digital, with numérique. Right. Uh, and we're living through a revolution, a digital revolution at the moment, which we don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. It's going in so many different directions. But they have made des, des entrevues with the numérique. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so uh, I think my message, to, especially to young people, yeah. forget about the old people, they're, they're impossible. But I think that the message to young people is that you can learn a lot by under, trying to understand how the industry developed. Yeah. When Paul went into the industry, kind of accidentally in 1895, mm. Um, it was not his biggest idea. Mm. Um, he didn't know where it was going to go. Mm. But the logic of what he was doing it's led him to, to become a pioneer and mm. to, to lay the foundations. Mm. I think we can learn something about that today. I think, that there, I think there are really interesting lessons about looking at digital and what it's good for mm. and being, having an open mind about what, how it might be eventually commercialized. Yeah. I mean, it is already commercialized, but who knows what the future has in store. Right. So I think there's a real arc of connection between the 1890s and the early 21st century. Mm. 
Je voudrais juste revenir un peu sur la question du nationalisme. Je trouve ça très intéressant parce que on s'est tellement méfié dans, dans l'histoire du cinéma, de la mon, monument, monumentalisation de, de l'histoire, le nationalisme qui est lié aux, ouais. aux premières, aux, yeah. euh, nous, nous étions là avant, etc. Yeah. Et, mais je, je pense qu'on s'est tellement euh, euh, inscrit en faux contre cette attitude que maintenant, finalement, quand il y a des, des choses importantes qui se sont arrivées, on ne le sait plus, en fait. Euh, et, et, par exemple, à Montréal, pendant très longtemps, il y avait, on savait que le, le cinématographe Lumière avait été dans, dans tel euh, euh, édifice, mais il n'y avait aucune plaque, il n'y avait aucune... Euh, et on, on, et c'est les, les, les historiens en premier qui ne veulent pas de, ouais. monumentaliser le, 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 l'histoire du cinéma, ouais. mais en faisant ça, on perd justement des repères, on perd le... le la connaissance de, 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 de cette histoire, en fait. Et je pense que sans les abus, le, le, le nationalisme qui, qui devient euh, complètement euh, bouffon, mm-hmm. euh, on devrait quand même euh, se rappeler que ces gens-là ont fait des, ont fait des choses importantes et, mm-hmm. et, qui, et qui sont des repères dans, dans l'histoire. Cette question de comment nous devons et comment nous devons mémorialiser the, the his, early history of cinema is a really interesting one because um, it, it, it challenges our sense of how we memorialize other, um, other branches of history. Mm. You know, um, why do we still talk about the Gutenberg Revolution? You know, was, was Gutenberg really the only person who was important to the, the coming of, mm. of printing and so forth? No, he wasn't, but it's convenient to use him as, a, as an excuse. So I think it's, it's an opportunity to have a more subtle, uh, more interesting form of history, which sees it as a kind of matrix, as a network of relationships. Mm. All of these people drew on somebody else. There are no single pioneers. Mm. There are people who are all drawing on someone else. Uh, A a researcher in Britain has recently demonstrated, for instance, I think very convincingly, that the Paul Akers camera, which was the second film camera Mm. in the world, actually, um, is probably based, inspired by Freeze Green mm. because they had access to Freeze Green's published um, patent. patent. Yeah. And so the more you delve into these things, the more you look carefully without prejudice, the more you see that everybody was making use of something else. Mm. But you also see, of course, that in many ways they didn't know what other people were doing. I mean, it was a world that was beginning to be networked mm. Uh, Paul was in contact with the Lumières and with Edison. Mm. Not interactively, but he was certainly writing to them. So it was a world in which people did communicate by by letter, by telegram, and so forth. But it was not yet a world in which everybody knew what everyone else was doing. Mm. And so it really is the beginnings of, you know, our modernity. It's very technological, it's very technologically sophisticated. We can see the beginnings of the sophistication that we take for granted. It's all there, but it hasn't quite taken the shape that it would take. So I think it's, it's, it's a good history to, to teach uh, about understanding the complexity of the world. Yeah. The, the, the problem is for, uh, le, le problème principal pour le grand public, c'est que bon, les historiens ont, ont, ont créé justement des, des rhizomes de, yeah. historiques, des, les, toutes les relations. Yeah. Mais le grand public, la, une des raisons pour lesquelles il, il ne retient pas cette histoire, c'est qu'il a besoin d'un récit avec des, des, des figures yeah. iconiques et une, cer- une certaine linéarité linéaire, temporelle. Euh, et donc, c'est très difficile, de, cette tension entre les historiens qui, qui essaient de faire des choses extrêmement complexes, extrêmement ri- avec un rhizome de, de relations, et le grand public qui, si on ne fait pas le récit, Justement, ils connaîtront pas euh, le, le début du cinéma britannique. Well, at the moment, in, in my exhibition in, in uh, North London, in a very, you know, a rather remote part of North London, I have a big banner outside which says, did you know that the cinema was born in Haringey? <laughs> Haringey is the, the part of London that uh, includes mm. Muswell Hill. Yeah. And really, I, I don't think the, uh, the big public the normal public wants to have a a line. They don't want to know that this led to this, led to this, this, this. They're just more interested in discovering uh, that there is... The network. The network, yeah. So I I don't think we should, we shouldn't assume that the public is, you know, um, simplistic. Mm. But they're certainly very ignorant about how these things started. And when I talk to people at the exhibition, uh, you can see that they're clearly surprised 
did cinema have a beginning? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not the kind of thing that you think yeah. had a beginning. Yeah, but it, that's a good question for an historian. It where's, is. where's the beginning? Where's the beginning? <laughs> where do we start? Yeah. So I've found actually that among ordinary people who are not specialists, there's actually a growing sense of, ooh, that's interesting, that's surprising. Yeah. I didn't know that, mm. that happened. So I think we should work with that and right. not try to create okay. a new timeline. I'm not trying to say, when I say Robert Paul and the invention of cinema, I'm not saying Robert Paul, the inventor of cinema, yeah, yeah, yeah. although I can show what he did, mm. but it's just about how to be, it reconfigures the invention of cinema. Okay. Vous avez parlé un peu plus tôt de la, la révolution numérique euh, qui, qui, bien sûr, est en train de, de changer, euh, a déjà changé le, le paysage oui. Et, oui. et la donne euh, par rapport au cinéma. Euh, le problème le, du numérique, c'est que c'est dé, dématérialisé, c'est assez abstrait. Et, et au colloque euh, sur la collection François Lemay, la, la collection François Lemay comme laboratoire, on a pris le parti pris justement de retourner vers la ma matérialité euh, en, bien sûr en lien avec yeah, yeah, tous yeah. les outils que nous offre yeah. le numérique, euh, dont, dont, dont ce film est un, est un exemple. Euh, Peut-être, euh, en, en terminant, nous dire justement c'est quoi l'intérêt de la, la matérialité, c'est quoi l'intérêt d'avoir ce genre d'appareil devant nous et d'essayer de comprendre concrètement, yeah. en fait, plutôt que… Parce que très souvent, les historiens, yeah. on, on va à l'université, on apprend notre métier dans les bouquins, dans, yeah. Yeah. Et, et on va dans les archives papier, dans les, dans les journaux, etc. Et c'est très, très rare, c'est ce, ce que la collection Lemay, euh, François Lemay de l'Université Laval permet, c'est de, de, de se confronter pour, souvent pour la première fois à un objet matériel mystérieux comme, comme, comme celui-ci. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's a really important point. And what I, I'm talking about here at the, the, the colloque um, is the idea of a material history which, um, which does start with machines because the cinema is, above all, a creation of the age of machines. Mm. And uh, I use um, a famous uh, essay uh, by the, the great American independent uh, avant-garde filmmaker, Hollis Frampton, mm. which he used this phrase, the last machine. I used it for a television series about mm. early cinema. And uh, what Hollis Frampton said is, cinema film is the last uh, uh, medium, last art, that will reach us um, through machinery. And what is a machine? A machine is something we look at it and we understand how it works by looking at its parts. The machine has parts, mm. it follows principles, mechanical principles, and we understand it. So I think using Hollis Frampton, who was writing in the 1970s, at the beginning of an interest in you know, early film and early photography, mm. using that as a way back into, yes, of course, this is a completely novel experience for most people today. I mean, if we look at um, a digital camera, Really, we have no idea how it works. And if we look at it, it doesn't tell us how it works. We would have to understand the circuit boards inside it, the chips, which we can't see. Mm. Whereas with this, we can see the principles at work. And so, but by analogy, it's quite interesting to see how something that belongs to the last stage of the media, the first stage of the media revolution, how it can inform us thinking about digital. I mean, maybe we have to think about digital also in terms of machines, mm. new style machines, but machines that we will eventually understand. Yeah. Like the history of gaming. People are now looking at early gaming consoles and saying, ah, yes, mm. I remember how that worked. Yeah. It was like a sort of a step towards a modern gaming console where everything is completely internalized. La, la seule différence, c'est que là, on peut tourner la, la manivelle et voir les roues dentées euh, très industrielles, très, très 19e siècle euh, euh, tourner, alors qu'on peut se demander dans, dans 100 ans comment ils vont faire pour faire marcher ces, ces, ces caméras euh, numériques. En fait. yeah. Peut-être que ça va être une boîte noire euh, yep. et, et on n'aura plus aucune idée de comment les, les, les faire. Euh, on va pouvoir analyser le contexte, mais peut-être pas les machines les faire remarcher à, à well. cette... Up to a point, my, my, um, my son-in-law, who is a physicist, he understands very well what happens inside okay. these, and he has no problems taking apart yeah. uh, a mobile phone and replacing different parts of it. So maybe, maybe you and I are speaking from the wrong generational mm -hmm. <laughs> perspective. Et donc, il va falloir avoir des historiens physicistes dans le futur, en fait. But there's no question that we, film historians have never 
felt they needed to understand objects, mm. equipment, mm. material things. And I think that's a big mistake. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why a lot of film history is, frankly, rubbish. Yeah. Because it's written from a completely distant point of view, yeah. which does not sufficiently understand the importance of the machinery, the equipment, all mm. the way through. And I was talking to one of the other participants um, last night, uh, Dave Kenning, about the importance of lenses. Mm. The lens. I cannot think of any uh, work of film history that's widely known, which is a serious discussion of lenses. Yeah. It's completely absent, and yet no cameras, no projectors mm. without lenses. And so there are many areas that it's not just um, brass wheels that turn. We mm. also have to think about the, the things that actually allow the light to be focused mm. on the film and on the screen. There are many frontiers that we haven't crossed yet, mm. which is why it's really important that we're spending time with these machines, mm. I think. C'est ce qu'on qu veut faire à l'Université Laval. En fait, on veut une collection d'études, une collection de yeah. recherches qui permet de comprendre les appareils yeah. en, en se confrontant vraiment à l'appareil, de ne pas juste regarder dans les catalogues, dans les, les manuels, yeah. etc. Et, et ça, c'est la première étape. Mais euh, effectivement, il y a des gens qui parlent des films comme yeah. s'ils venaient de l'éther, euh, dans le ciel des Absolutely. idées, etc. Absolutely. Et ils n'ont aucune idée que c'est... Ou en, en tous les cas, ils n'en parlent pas que ces films-là ont été faits par des machines. Et c'est comme si c'était indifférent, en fait. Absolutely. Ça n'a au, aucune importance. Je pense qu'on doit mettre cette période derrière nous. Oui. Peut-être avec affection. Mais je pense qu'on doit regarder à une période où nous sommes conscients de ce qu'il est que, oui, qui produit les films. Qui okay. produit les films que nous sommes intéressés en. Et ce qui a remplacé les films. Mais c'est une autre histoire. Yeah. Je pense que c'est un excellent mot de la fin. Merci, euh, monsieur euh, professeur Christian. Avec <laughs> plaisir. Merci. Euh,